Democrat strategists working around the clock have perfected a new plan of attack against Donald Trump. Emerging from resistance headquarters in the storm-shrouded crags of Mount Rakestep, the Democrat geniuses have produced a 40,000-page blueprint for their new strategy entitled Endless Outrage, followed by Investigations and Impeachment. Speaking for the Democrat Brain Trust, Professor Skeezy von Schmachtdoodle told reporters, quote, This finally is the plan we've been waiting for. I don't know why we didn't think of it before now. If we can just express outrage over every word the president says and enlist our media allies to transform every trivial eccentricity into the sort of shocking scandal that has absolutely nothing to do with people's lives, then surely the public will eventually come around and give up the nation's peace and prosperity in order to denounce the atrocities this president is committing in our imaginations. Then, when the ground is prepared, we unleash the big gun, impeachment. Once the public sees that we have actually produced a list of obscure but legal-sounding sort of crimes and almost misdemeanors, they will absolutely glue themselves to their TVs, shaking their heads in shock and awe at the uplifting eloquence of Adam Schiff's historic sanctimonious hypocrisy." Unquote. When asked how this plan would differ from what the Democrats have been doing up till now, Professor von Schmachtnudel replied, quote, huh? Unquote. Other Democrats, however, are said to be very excited about the new anti-Trump strategy. Sources say House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is already picking out a black dress she feels will emphasize the prayerful, sacramental seriousness Chris Matthews will absurdly say she has. She's also trying to rememorize the Pledge of Allegiance since it's been several months since she used it last and the words keep slipping her mind. At CNN, elite intellectual Don Lemon told his teddy bear named Cudley, quote, Oh, man, wait till all those stupid Rube Americans see this baby. With this plan and an 80-year-old communist at the top of our ticket, I don't see how we can lose. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. I feel hunky-dunky, life is tickety-boo. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky dunky dee -dee. Ship-shaped, ipsy-topsy, the world is a bitty zing. It's a wonderful day, hurrah, hooray! It makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray! Oh, hooray, hurrah! So I just learned yesterday, I didn't know this up until, up until yesterday, that we are actually taking Monday off. We're going dark on Monday, so it is a long Clavenless weekend you are facing, so please huddle close to your device and suck out all the Clavenly goodness you can because uh, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be a big one, a tough one to survive. You know, one of the unconscious urges I think dominates human life is the urge to appear virtuous to ourselves and others. People are always talking about the sex drive and the denial of death. They have all these kind of totalizing theories about what motivates human beings. But the urge to hide our fallen natures from ourselves and create the illusion of virtue, I think, is at least one of the most important. Recently, I've been asking myself, why exactly are Democrats in a panic about Bernie Sanders? Aren't they supposed to be socialists? Don't they like this? Is it because they think he can't win or because they think he might win or that someone like him might win eventually? Bernie's voters are young and energized. So far, people like Buttigieg and Klobuchar are just divvying up the Q-tips like me, the old guys. This doesn't mean Bernie owns the future. Some of these youngsters will learn stuff as they grow older and they'll vote for better candidates when they know more. But some of them are going to be as ignorant tomorrow as they are now, and their radicalism is probably here to stay, which means Bernie might own the future. Left and then more left may be the way the Democrat Party is going. Democrats like James Carville and Barack Obama say they oppose Bernie because he can't win. They don't denounce his policies. They just say it's too soon for socialism. The people aren't ready for it yet. Are they telling the truth or are they really afraid that Bernie or someone like Bernie eventually will win? I mean, it's not outlandish to suspect that some Democrats may have been lying about their actual goals. Obama can talk about how at some point you'll have too much money, but he's making hundreds of millions of dollars in book and movie deals. You think he's making too much? You think he wants to give some of that back? Rachel Maddow must enjoy mouthing socialist bromides while bringing down a big TV salary she's not sharing with anyone. Al Gore, he obviously loves wringing his hands over climate change while buying big houses and flying around in private jets. He sold his TV company to Al Jazeera in Qatar, which is one of the biggest, I think the biggest carbon footprint on earth. 
Now, what about those Occupy protesters? I'm sure it's lots of fun to complain about evil corporations while you're using your Apple iPhone to Google what sort of Shea t-shirt you can buy on Amazon. Maybe some of these folks don't like Bernie because Bernie is crazy enough to be serious. He's ruining their little make-believe game. Embracing socialism makes you feel virtuous. It's Christianity without, you know, the Christianity. But ideas are dangerous things. You play with them enough and they might blow up in your face. If Democrats really don't want Bernie in their future, they should change the anti-American Howard Zinn garbage they teach our children. They should change the messages in the movies they make. They should stop writing socialist baloney in the op-ed page of the New York Times. But then they wouldn't look virtuous. And people will do almost anything to look virtuous, including destroy their own country and their own lives. We're going to talk about the Democrats' predicament and about the strange case of Robert Stone. Really interesting story. Uh, the great short hope of Michael Bloomberg. And maybe we'll even talk about some Valentine's Day. But first, let's talk about Raycon. I love these things. These are wireless earbuds that are so good. I use them all the time. I go hiking. and I'm always listening to auto audiobooks when I hike. And I hate the ones that most people use because they make you look like an insect. You know? I mean, you do. You look like an insect. These are stylish. They're comfortable. They have also, uh, they have different size buds at the end, so you can change them and make them fit your ear. Raycon earbuds are stylish and discreet. They've got no dangling wires or stems. By the way, oh, and they sound great, by the way. The sound is absolutely terrific. Uh, they're so comfortable and perfect for on-the-go listening and for taking phone calls. They're easy to use. They've got little tap signals that you can use with them. Really terrific. You've heard me talk about how the company was co-founded by Ray J and celebrities like Snoop Dogg and Cardi B are obsessed with Raycons. Pick up a pair and see what the hype is all about. Now's the time to get the latest and greatest from Raycon. You get 15% off your order at buyraycon.com slash Clavin. That's buyraycon.com slash Clavin for 15% off Raycon wireless earbuds. Buy, B-U-Y, raycon.com slash Clavin. Just tap on them. They say, how do you spell Clavin? there are no that's what you will actually hear in your ear. If you there are no reason. <laughs> I'm just making that part up. It's me hearing it in my ear. And buy the Nightmare Feast. Go on Amazon.com and pre-order Nightmare Feast book two in the Another Kingdom trilogy. If you enjoyed the podcast or even if you haven't heard it and just want to read it, the book is beautiful. It is very helpful to me when you pre-order it because it moves it up the Amazon ranks, which is really a big deal for me. So I hope if you're going to get it, you will go ahead and pre-order it right away. And if you're not going to get it, I hope you'll get it anyway and pre-order it. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of the same things now with Bernie kind of moving up after New Hampshire. We're seeing a lot of the things we saw with the rise of Donald Trump on the right. You get the denial and the disbelief. And here's Democrat hack uh, Chuck Todd saying that, no, nah, Bernie, Bernie's not the, he's not the front runner. No, 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 no. I don't know why some people, I feel like the only people that are going out on the limb and calling Bernie Sanders a front runner, they have an, other reasons to call him front runner. It feels like there's no front runner right now. One person leads delegates. One person um, has a lock on a chunk of the party. Well, we don't know where this goes. Is he the front runner? He does certainly not get in the press as a front runner. And, and the problem is, the, the I, I, I don't understand how Bernie is considered a front runner. This is a guy that had more <laughs> more people showed up to the polls, highest turnout ever, and his percentage went down that up. Yeah. You're a lying dog faced pony soldier. Yeah, he is a lying dog faced pony shoulder, soldier. That makes absolutely no sense because last time he was only running, Bernie was only running against Mallory or Hillbilly. What was her name? I can't remember. But they, you know, he was only running against the one candidate. All the other candidates were nobodies. Now it's a big field. So he's got a lesser percentage. Uh, of votes and he gets less votes, but he still won the day. They're talking about Pete Buttigieg, uh, you know, and one of the ladies in that conversation, finally, you know, they brought up the fact, she said, I think people will vote for a gay candidate. She said, I think most Americans, she said, 70% of Americans will vote for a gay candidate. And the Democrats, of course, are so much more tolerant than, than we evil uh, Republicans are. But, I, you know, I, I disagree with her. She doesn't know. I don't know. You're just kind of gauging the, uh, you're gauging the field. You're gauging what what America, where the attitudes of America are, and you, nobody knows that, and even a pollster can't really find it out because people lie. But the thing is, right this minute, Buttigieg is a long shot. He's a mayor of a small town, essentially. He has very little experience. He's gay, which is going to cost him, I think, I think too many votes. But How we'll dare you? How dare I? I know. But still, I, I, I wish I could get her out of my head. I wish I could quit her. How uh, dare you? <laughs> but, but the thing is, right now, Bernie Sanders is 
the front runner. I mean, it, it can change, right? To Super Tuesday will come and it can change. But right now, he's the front runner. And what are they afraid of? I think this is the thing that's really uh, worth taking a look at. Are they afraid? Are they af- really afraid of socialism? Or do they all agree with Bernie? They just don't think it's the time. Because the thing about socialism is you don't see any Americans living socialist lives. I mean, you don't see any of these people. Just like I said before, Al Gore is not living a carbon clean life. And, you know, none of none of these people. Bernie Sanders is a millionaire. Bernie Sanders was caught on the fr- on first class on a train. You should see the picture, the look on his face. Oh, don't take pictures of me. So I, I want to see, I want to take a really close look at what is happening to the Democrats right now. Uh, yesterday, we played James Carville, for instance. I was playing, I can't remember if it was yesterday or the day before. I was trying to show the divisions in the Democrat Party, not among the candidates, but among the commentators, among the people looking on. You had Michael Moore saying, we owe it to America to uh, get Bernie Sanders in there and to hell with the establishment. And then you had James Carville, and he's always like this kind of overdramatic uh, guy. And he was saying, no, 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 we're going into the desert like the British Labor Party. We're going into the socialist la-la land. So here is um, Bernie Sanders on Anderson Cooper responding to that. James, in all due respect, is a political hack uh, who said very terrible things when he was working for Clinton uh, against Barack Obama. I think he said some of the same things. Uh, Look, we are taking on the establishment. This is no secret to anybody. We're taking on the wall. I guess uh, the former head of Goldman Sachs uh, attacked me uh, yesterday. Yeah, he had some other things as well. He did, yeah. Wall Street. The insurance companies don't like me. And you know what? The pharmaceutical industry which is charging us 10 times more for the same drugs they sell in Canada, they don't like me either, nor does the fossil fuel industry, because their product happens to be destroying our planet, nor does the military-industrial complex or the prison-industrial complex. We are taking on Trump, the Republican establishment, Carvel, and the Democratic establishment. But at the end of the day, the grassroots movement that we are putting together of young people, of working people, of people of color, want real change. Crazy Bernie. He is one crazy dude. <laughs> I, like, I like when Bernie says, with all due respect, James Carville is a hack. James Carville is a hack. And I guess that is his due respect, which is none. I guess that's the idea. There was all the respect he is due, which is none. So Bernie's argument here, Bernie's argument is that the establishment is sclerotic. It's done. Kind of what Trump did with the Republicans. He wiped them away. He started really a new Republican Party. And everybody was so uh, angry about that because they wanted everybody wanted the way it was. And he changed that. Bernie is saying he, too, will do this, right? that he's going to wipe away the Democrat Party and replace it with this socialist party that is the grassroots, it's the young people, it's those young people who vote for him, so it's the future. Here's another take from Dan Henniger at the Wall Street Journal, Daniel Henniger, who wrote a really good piece that I just thought was a totally different way of looking at this. It's called the Incompetence Party. And he says, now that Bernie Sanders, once an obscure socialist senator from Vermont, is officially the frontrunner for the Democratic presidential nomination, it is time to confront what that means. It does not mean the U.S. is flirting with socialism. That's not going to happen. Now, the polls agree with him on this, by the way. The meaning of Bernie's ascent is that the Democratic Party, older even than he is, has simply run out of gas. So what Henniger is saying is, yes, the establishment is sclerotic and finished, but there's nothing there. Bernie does not represent the future. The future represents something else. That's a really interesting take. And he's saying that the uh, the fact that Bernie is the front runner, but he's also unelectable. I made a similar point a couple of days back. You know, when when we were talking on backstage with Ben and uh, Jeremy, the God King of the Daily Wire, they were saying they would prefer to have Biden as the candidate because if he won, it wouldn't be as ca- catastrophic. They're afraid he would win. And I said, you know, I'll take my chances with the American people. Give me Bernie so people can see that that is not where America is going to go. And I, I No, that's a risk because Bernie would be a truly destructive force if he won, but I don't believe he would win. And Henniger is saying the same thing, and he's saying that means that the Democrat Party, as it stands, its ideas are done. He says the Democrats resemble Europe's aging political parties, Britain's Labour Party, France's Socialists, Germany's Social Democrats, and Christian Democrats all have simply deflated with voters. The party's problem is that it doesn't look competent anymore. Now, this is not what I would say is the party's problem. I would say that their ideas have hit the wall, but maybe that's partly the same thing. He's saying it's just sheer competence. 
Listen to this argument. It's really interesting. He says, during the Depression, Franklin Roosevelt struck a defining bargain with the public. Cede to the government expanded powers over the details of American life, and government will administer it, uh, your life efficiently. For the public, giving government the power to regulate and rule was supposed to be a net plus. The bargain behind Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All, funded by new taxes on the middle class, is that it, too, will be a net plus. Now, see, my argument about this is always the moral argument. Don't cede your freedom for anything because there's always something. There's always a benefit that they can offer you for your freedom. There's always something the governments will give you that will take your freedom away. And remember, nothing in life is free. Nothing is paid for by billionaires. It's always paid for by you. Even if it's not paid for in money, it's paid for in freedom. When the government does something, it gets to decide how that thing is done. If it does your health, it gets to decide who dies. Oh, yeah, we're not going to give you health. You're old. We're not going to give you health anymore. Those are the death panels they were talking about, which actually were a part of Obamacare. When the government decides on your health, can start to say, you know, if you smoke, I'm sorry, you don't get this benefit, so you have to give up smoking before. The government controls your life through the things it gives you. The government is never giving. It's always taking away. So, so my argument is the moral argument. Henninger's argument is don't give them the power because they don't know what they're doing. He says, in those places where the modern Democratic Party is in charge, they often govern badly or incompetently on a grand scale. Misgovernance related to crime, homelessness, poor schools, and affordability has become the symbol of democratic control in large U.S. cities such as New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Baltimore, Chicago, and St. Louis. U.S. Census data shows people voting with their feet, moving out of the Northeast and Far West into the less bureaucratized Southern and Mountain states. A major reason for these internal refugee flows is that Democratic legislatures and city councils, New York, Seattle, San Francisco, reflexively pass progressive policies disconnected from commercial or social reality. So that's a different argument. It's an interesting argument, and it's probably a very realistic argument. He's saying that people moving out of red state, uh, out of blue states for red states are moving out because conditions are bad. They're not moving out uh, for moral reasons, which is why I'd like to see them run out. But the problem with an argument like Henninger's is that if the government does something well, then people can be convinced to cede their freedom to them. That's what you have in France. In France, they say the medical care is good. I don't, I don't know. I've only had one experience with a French doctor. She was terrific. But I don't know what their system is like overall, not having lived there. But the thing is, in France, they control your speech. They control your wage hours, your wages. You don't have the kind of freedom that you have here. I want my freedom, even if sometimes it means taking risks and even if sometimes it doesn't work out as well as something the government might do. But Henniger is making the other point is that the Democrat Party is just incompetent. And that was what was so hilarious about Iowa you know, was that they they want to take over your health care. They can't even run their own elections. Tom Perez, the head of the DNC, he made this comment about this. He says there is no divide in the Democrat Party. I think the real uh, thing that folks understand is that what unites us far exceeds what our differences are. There's no ideological divide on the need to ensure that people with pre-existing conditions to keep their health care. There's no ideological divide about the need to ensure that we hold pharmaceutical companies accountable so that we can lower the cost of prescription drugs. There's no ideological divide on the need to make sure that one good job should be enough. The differences between the uh, Democratic Party candidates and Donald Trump, whoever the nominee is, are a hundred percent. It was all bull. <laughs> I, I think he's a lying dog face pony soldier, but no, listen. You're a lying dog face pony soldier. <laughs> the thing about Perez, if Perez is right, then Henniger is right. If there is no ideological ideological divide in the Democrat Party, and they can't win, and all they've got is Bernie Sanders, then they're done. That means if there's no ideological divide, that means your party is dead anyway. It means it's intellectually dead. If everybody's walking in lockstep, if everybody agrees, if there are no arguments going on, you're a dead party. You're done. And if it's true that people are looking at and saying, yeah, Bernie, Bernie Sanders is the only person anyone's getting excited about, but nobody's really excited about anybody, which is really, I think, the situation, I think the bind they're in, then the Democratic Party may be finished as it is. That doesn't mean it's going away. It means it's going to have to change as the Republican Party is changing under Trump. That's why so many number of Trumpers are disgruntled, because the party is changing because it had to. So <laughs> Donald Trump had a 
has this, there's a new thing going on. I was making this joke about the Democrats uh, wanting to impeach Donald Trump. They think it's a great new idea. That is absolutely true. So <laughs> it's absolutely true. They're going right back to investigations. They started, they thought they were going to get some, you know, energy going over the firing of Gordon Sundland, the EU ambassador, and uh, the, that NSC uh, Ukraine expert, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Alex Vindman. Remember, they testified against Trump that he was, you know, dealing with Ukraine and then Trump fired him and suddenly everybody's going, he's firing his enemies. Well, look, Trump should have done that a long time ago. It's not that he's firing his enemies now, it's that he didn't fire them before. That was the problem. There's a, a piece in the uh, Wall Street Journal today of a guy who worked in the uh, NSC and says it was littered with resistance anti-Trumpers. So Trump would say, I want to pull out of Afghanistan, and they would immediately go to work preparing reports on why that couldn't be done. And then H.R. McMasters would come into Trump and say, well, I'm sorry, it can't be done. So this guy, his name is Rich Higgins, he wrote a, uh, a paper saying this, the NSC is filled with anti-Trump uh, traders, and he was fired. He, the guy who wrote the report is fired. So Trump had every right to fire these guys. But now they've got the Roger Stone thing going on. So. Roger Stone, kind of sleazy, one of these sleazy fixers that Trump hangs out with all the time, the Michael Cohens and the guy from Pecker from the, uh, from the, what's it called, the exam, the, uh, I forgot the name of that paper, the tabloid paper, but it, what, Roger Stone is one of these guys, and he's a sleazy guy, and he was convicted of lying to Congress and of tampering with witnesses in the Russian collusion investigation, the Mueller and congressional uh, Russian collusion investigation. And the DOJ prosecutors recommended he be sentenced to seven to nine years in prison. Okay. Now, obviously, this is absurd. It's a process crime. There was no Russian collusion. So the crime wouldn't have existed if the bogus investigation hadn't existed in the first place. But the reason they were recommending such a long period of time, seven to nine years, uh, is what's because of what's called enhancement. He threatened. Stone has got this big mouth, like all these New York tough guys, he, you know, these guys who think they're New York tough guys. He's got this big mouth. And he said to this witness, uh, what was his name? Uh, Randy, oh, um, let me see, Randy Credico. He was a, a DJ, a talk radio guy, and he was going to testify about some WikiLeaks thing. And Stone said to him, I'm going to take your dog, and there's not an effing thing you can do about it either because you're weak, broke, piece of blank. And he says, I'm so ready. Let's get it on. Prepare to die. This is what Stone said. Now, even Credico said that this is just the way Stone talks, and he never took it seriously. But that's threatening a witness. That's threatening a witness, and that's why you get the enhancement. That's why you get the seven to nine year recommendation. So Trump sends out a tweet saying that's too much. And Trump has been basically fighting for his old pal, uh, you know, um, fighting for his old pal Stone. Let's, cut, let's play cut number four. They treated Roger Stone very badly. They treated everybody very badly. And if you look at the Mueller investigation, it was a scam because it was illegally set up. It was set up based on false documentation and false documents. You look at what happened, how many people were hurt, their lives were destroyed, and nothing happened with all the people that did it and launched a scam. Where's Comey? Why, where is Comey? What's happening to McCabe? What's happening to Lisa and uh, Peter Strzok and Lisa Page? What's happening with them? It was a whole setup. It was a disgrace for our country, and everyone knows it, too. Everyone, including NBC, which gives a lot of fake news. The fact is that Roger Stone was treated horribly, and so were many other people. Their lives were destroyed. And it turns out, you look at the FISA warrants and what just happened with FISA, where they found out it was fixed, that it was a dirty, rotten deal. So Trump tweets that, that Stone is being treated unfairly, and the next day, Bill Barr, the attorney general, they lessen the recommendation for sentencing. Barr says that it had nothing to do with Trump, that they had already made this decision, that it was seven to nine years was way too high for this process crime. They, I think they reduced it to 2.3, two, two to three years. And the prosecutors who were handling the case, three of them resigned from the case, one of them resigned from the DOJ in protest to this, saying basically the president was tampering with justice. And so we'll get back to this in just a second. But first, teeth. 
Teeth, fix your teeth. Look in the wind, look in the mirror. Do you want to look like that forever? Of course you don't. So go to Candid. Unlike braces, Candid will give you clear aligners that are comfortable, removable, totally invisible. You can transform your smile without anyone noticing a thing. You'll never have to set foot in a doctor's office or waiting room. Your treatment is prescribed and monitored remotely by a licensed orthodontist. With other remote clear aligner co uh, options, you may never hear from a doctor. Candid only works with experienced orthodontists. Only only experts in tooth movements, never just general dentists. With Candid, your treatment will be remotely monitored by that same orthodontist throughout, so you'll never have to wonder how everything is going. With Candid, the average treatment length is just six months, and you'll start seeing results way before then. Learn, bef learn more about Candid's process and get a complimentary 3D scan of your teeth at a Candid studio near you. It's the simplest, freest way to get started. Are you ready to take the first step towards straighter teeth for a limited time? You can get started with 75 bucks off by using code CLAY at candidco.com slash Claven. That's candidco.com slash Claven. Use code Claven for 75 bucks off at candidco.com slash Claven. Code Claven. I know what you're saying. You're looking at your possibly beautiful teeth and thinking, how do I spell Claven? There are no <laughs> E-V-A-N. So, okay. So Trump tweets that they should lessen the sentence recommendation. They lessen the sentence recommendation. Eric Swalwell, remember him? He's you. Remember, he's the guy who said, I am you? Well, he is he, and here he is. He's got a great idea on how to handle this. I'm very concerned uh, that the independence of prosecutors, the ability of judges to just weigh the facts uh, and the evidence uh, is eroding, that the president's taken a wrecking ball uh, to that. And he was just impeached for that. We're not going to stop holding him accountable. We've learned when you hold him accountable, you can actually stop the corruption, whether he's removed or not. And ultimately, it's going to be for the voters to judge in November. Might you impeach him over this, over Roger Stone and the sentencing? You know, we're not going to take our options off the table. We don't wake up in the morning wanting to impeach him. You know, we want to work with him on prescription drugs, background checks, and infrastructure. But we're not going to let him just, you know, torch this democracy because he thinks that he's been let off once and we're not going to do something about it. <laughs> hey, we're, we're lowering the tone of the show a little bit here. <laughs> you know, but these guys, these guys never learn. I mean, Trump just gained 10 percentage points because of their last stupid impeachment thing. So let's take a look at this. How do we feel about this? Because, you know, Matt Margolis at PJ Media writes a piece about all the times that Barack Obama helped out a pal. I mean, starting with the Black Panther Party. Remember that Black Panther guy was standing outside a, a voting booth intimidating people with a baton and all this? And Eric Holder said, well, I can't prosecute, her he's, prosecute him because he's one of my people. Like, this is the attorney general talking about my people, meaning black people, not the American people. Uh, the, Holder himself, Eric Holder, stonewalled on Fast and Furious, and Obama stepped up and gave him executive privilege. The worst one, the one that was ugly, was the one in 2009, uh, Barack Obama illegally fired Gerald Walpin, the inspector general uh, for the Corporation for National and Community Service. Walpin's crime was that he was investigating Obama's friend and donor, Kevin Johnson, who had misused federal grant money by funneling it to his personal nonprofit group and paying for political activity and using it to pay hush money to underage girls he sexually abused. So that was a good one. And of course, Hillary Clinton was the big one. She never got prosecuted for that. So Obama did a lot of this stuff. And of course, he was scandal free we have to remember so that that is absolutely true and when they started some of the people were calling i think nancy pelosi was calling for uh bar to be uh, fired and trey gowdy responded to that to marshall mccallum on fox prosecutors don't send its people presidents don't send its people fox news commentators don't send its people judges do and we give them life yeah tenure so they can make these calls. But the notion that Bill Barr should resign is about the dumbest damn thing I have ever heard. If a United States senator really believes that the head of the Department of Justice cannot weigh in on what a proportional sentence is, I mean, there are child pornographers who don't get nine years, Martha. There are people who rob banks that don't get nine years. So let the judge decide. I, I, I think two or three years is, is, is about right. I think we have to say here, in all honesty, if Trump had just not done the tweet, if he just kept his mouth shut for one lousy time, Barr was going to do this anyway. I really believe that. Bill Barr seems to me a straight shooter. I think he would have done this anyway. 
You know, I remember being in New York and a guy got in an elevator and he was listening to when Obama was president and he's and Obama was talking on a TV above the bar and he got in the elevator and he looked at me and he said, every time you're a line dog face pony soldier, he says, every time Obama opens his mouth, the stock market drops. I get it. You're a smart guy. Shut up. The same thing is true with Trump sometimes. You know, I get it. You're a tough guy. You fight the powers. You fight the press. You fight the Democrats. You're not afraid. Sometimes, just sometimes, you got to shut up. I don't believe that this is corruption, but it looks like corruption and it shouldn't. All right. Last week, I told you all about this terrific new podcast by my friend Bill Whittle, The Cold War, What We Saw. Over the weekend, this podcast reached number one in history podcasts and number five on all of Apple podcasts. So rest easy knowing that I have impeccable taste. The Cold War, What We Saw, captures what it was like to live through major events like the Berlin Airlift, the Korean War, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the Space Race. The story ties all of these milestones together in a tapestry that illustrates the apocalypse that never happened. The story is so well told. Bill is really great at these historical things. He really knows how to tell them. And it shows you that it was a battle, not just for capitalism, but for civilization itself. The first two episodes in this 12-part podcast are available right now. It's a perfect time to listen as the 2020 election gets even crazier and they start to push for this socialism nonsense again. Just go to dailywire.com slash cold war and start listening to this incredible and incredibly important story. That's dailywire.com slash cold war with Bill Whittle. We got to say goodbye to Facebook and YouTube. Come on over to dailywire.com and subscribe. So because nobody wants to accept the rise of Bernie Sanders, because it's just, it's just like with Trump. Now, again, Sanders may lose. He may lose in the upcoming Super Tuesday. They may, you know, he may uh, falter as he goes forward. But right now, I think he has got the plurality that you need. Because remember, you can you can win these things with 30 percent of the vote, like Trump did every place you go, because it's not a one on one thing. It's a group of people. And if you get 30 percent of the vote, you can win. Some of the Democrats are talking about the idea that this is a great opportunity for Michael Bloomberg. Michael Bloomberg, of course, has been, he, he's just got endless money and he's funneling all this money into ads and he's waiting on Super Tuesday, okay? So you'll, you'll hear this on the press. Here's, here's one from MSNBC, it's cut 13. The second number that I think people need to watch is, you know, over 55% of voters voted for a moderate candidate. They said the most important issue is who can beat Donald Trump. And that, if you're looking at that number, the big number, the big winner last night could be Mayor Bloomberg as he gets ready for Battleship Bloomberg and this unbelievable spending that's about to come our way. He's sitting back here ready to make a case that he's the best candidate. So we are in early days uh, and it's going to be very interesting moving forward. You're a lion dog face pony soldier. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have, to, I have to say, we got a little bit of a taste of what this would look like, and it looked like it would be a fun uh, race. Both of these guys are New York billionaires, both of them successful businessmen. Donald Trump, <laughs> Bloomberg is short. Okay, he's like five foot four. I mean, he's really short. And so little Michael will <laughs> fail. <laughs> so this is what. So uh, Trump tweets: Mini Mike is a five foot four inch mass of dead energy who does not want to be on the debate stage with these professional politicians. No boxes, please. He keeps accusing uh, Bloomberg of standing on a box so he doesn't look so short. He says Bloomberg hates crazy Bernie and will, with enough money, possibly stop him. Bernie's people, meaning his voters, will go nuts. And Mike Bloomberg <laughs> tweets, tweets, I love politics. Mike Bloomberg tweets back, real Donald Trump, we know, that's t Trump's uh, Twitter handle, Donald Trump, we know many of the same people in New York behind your back. They laugh at you <laughs> and call you a carnival barking clown. They know you inherited a fortune and squandered it with stupid deals and incompetence. I have the record and the resources to defeat you. And I will. Here is uh, Bloomberg making that case uh, to, to his audience. Cut eight. That's not all we have, all we need to win, because let's face it, Donald Trump is the world's biggest schoolyard billy, bully with no respect for civility, decency, or the facts. And our party needs a candidate who can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him and take the fight to him, and I'm going to do that. Just 
just think about the past few weeks. The president has been busy insulting the Democratic candidates. He does that a lot, you know. When you can't defend your record on health care or wages or the environment, you resort to insults. Well, Donald Trump's insults do not bother me. I've never run away from a fight. And I can just tell you he's not going to bully, bully me. I keep saying Billy, bully me. And it won't, I won't let him bully you either. You're a lying dog faced pony soldier. <laughs> I just, I'm going to play that clip forever. I'm a, you're a lying dog faced pony soldier. I think that may be the funniest uh, 2020 quote of all. So let's assess Bloomberg for a minute. Obviously, nobody knows the future. He has never been on a debate stage with any of these people. He has not got a sparkling personality. He has got this kind of elitist, superior, uh, you know, attitude toward people where he just treats individuals like like they're nothing, like they're nobody. I mean, we were talking about that yesterday with his remarks about black um, criminals who were being stopped by stop and search. It wasn't so much what he was saying about stop and search, although I have issues with that. I'll talk about that in a minute. It was the kind of just the attitude of these guys. He's got to throw them up against the wall and all the suspects. You could just Xerox the description of the suspects of some young black guy, you know. that's He talks like that about everybody. I mean, that's not racism with uh, Bloomberg. They, he talks like that about everybody. You know, he knows what you should eat. He knows what you should drink. Was he a good mayor of New York? There's a cycle in politics. It goes like this. The left destroys something, it destroys the country. They get to the place where people just cannot stand the left anymore, and finally they react. So you got that with Jimmy Carter, right? You got that with Barack Obama. Remember, people like Barack Obama personally, but they wiped out every uh, Democrat in, in the country, he lost his job because of Barack Obama. So they didn't like his policies. So when people finally get fed up with leftist policies, they finally vote for a right winger. You had this with Ronald Reagan. You had it with Donald Trump. You had it with Rudy Giuliani in New York. Right wingerdom works. Conservatism works. It's not just right. It's just not just moral. It also works. Capitalism works. Freedom works. Honesty work. All these things work, right? So Ronald Reagan turned the country around. He really turned the country around. It was, it was real. I was there. It was an amazing, amazing thing. Uh, Rudy Giuliani turned New York around. New York went from a hellhole. I was there for that, too. I lived in New York when you couldn't go outdoors. You got a pack of cigarettes without taking your life in your hands. Rudy Giuliani turned that city around, made it one of the great cities in the world. Uh, Donald Trump was turning America around. America was kind of becoming this kind of low energy, low profits, low GDP. Donald Trump has turned all that around as well. Once that happens, and once people start feeling good, and once they're not, uh, you know, uh, afraid of crime all the time, and once they're not afraid of the Soviet Union, and once they're not afraid of the government destroying everything, then they get a placekeeper, a placeholder. They start to sink back into leftism. So you get a Bill Clinton who is a savvy enough politician not to step on the Reagan boom, okay? He was helped along by the tech boom as well, but still, he was savvy enough to say, oh, the era of big government is over. He wanted to bring that back. Those were his instincts. He was a left-winger at heart, but he was a smart enough politician to keep the Reagan boom going for another eight years, and that's what he did. In And in... Um, in New York, after Giuliani fixed New York, Bloomberg was a savvy enough politician to keep that going. But one of the ways he kept it going was with stop and frisk, and stop and frisk worked. It worked for exactly the reasons Bloomberg said. The high crime areas were the black areas. The cops know who to stop to get the guns. They, they, they always say they should have called it stop, question, and frisk because they didn't just throw people up against the wall. They saw you walking down the street and your pants weren't hanging right and they knew you were... Listen, I've talked to cops about this and I've stood with them on corners and they'll go, that guy's got a gun, that guy's got a gun. They know who's got a gun. So now he's got to apologize for all this and he's apologizing for stuff that worked because that's where the Democrat Party is. The Democrat Party is in a place where you have to apologize for doing stuff that works if it offends people. Again, there were ways to talk about stop and frisk. And he didn't end it. Well, he didn't end it, actually. A federal court ended it. But there are ways to stop uh, to talk about stop and frisk without being offensive to people. I thought he was rude, too. I don't think you talk to people like that. Most black people, obviously, are law-abiding citizens. Most black people are the victims of crime, not... Uh, the, most black people are, are in danger of being the victims of crime, not the criminals. So there's a way to speak to people with respect about the trouble going on in their neighborhood. He didn't do that. And he he once said he once said that he didn't want to run because he didn't want to go on a Democrat apology tour. Well, he's on that tour now. Then he's got the stuff with women. 
you know, this is pretty standard stuff. He was a guy who liked to say, look at the ass on that girl. You know, he was always saying stuff like that. But he's, his record with women and his businesses is not bad. Uh, he, you know, that's the, <laughs> the other day. The other day I was on the elliptical machine. You know, I couldn't get out to hike. So I got on my uh, machine to exercise. And I thought I'd watch something while I was exercising, take my mind off. And I called up Amazon Prime. And there was the first season of Star Trek. And I'm, I was never a big Star Trek fan, but I thought I'd go back and watch episode one and all this. And it was the, the way they treated women in it was hilarious. First of all, all the women had these short, short skirts. They were wearing 60s outfits, the big beehive uh, hairdo. And every time they'd walk by on the spaceship, they'd have the guys going, look at that space babe. <laughs> Come like on. To, I, 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 Come like, on, man. I'd like, I'd like to do a little anti-gravity with her, my friend. You know, <laughs> Beam me into that baby. <laughs> So it was just, just the way guys talked in those days. And that's the thing that, uh, that he's going to have to deal you. with. How dare you? But, but I, think, I think he's a, a sound candidate. I think he'll lose. I don't think he's going to win the nomination. But he could. He's, he is in there with a chance. And it is interesting that people are turning to a Democrat who he ran for mayor as a Republican. So he's a Democrat who ran as a Republican and became a Democrat who'd be running against a Democrat who became a Republican and stayed a Republican. And that tells you something. That tells you something about the state of both parties, that both parties are in flux, that both parties are changing. And the people who try to get in the way of that change or don't accept that change are just going to have to move aside because that change is inevitable. And it is coming. For the Democrats, I think it is going to be more dramatic because I think Henniger has a point and their ideas are dead. All right. A final reflection. Valentine's Day is coming. Valentine's Day. I hate Valentine's Day. I, my wife had a hilarious line about Valentine's Day. I was sitting around, you know, my dreamy way. I've like totally forgotten this is going on. And I kind of looked up from whatever it was I was reading. And I, I said to her, oh, you know, Valentine's Day. Is, isn't Valentine's, shouldn't we be going out to dinner or something? And my wife said, Valentine's Day is for amateurs. <laughs> I cracked up. And the reason I cracked up is because that's the way I feel about drinking holidays. That's the way I feel about St. Patrick's Day and New Year's Day when guys go, yeah, we're going to go out there and party. I always think, Amateurs, amateurs. Why? Because because I love alcohol. I control my alcohol intake because I don't want to destroy myself, and I certainly don't. I don't actually like getting drunk, so I don't want to be drunk. But I do love alcohol, and if if called upon, I can drink you under the table. If called upon, I can drink all night. There are people here, including Mr. Knowles, who have seen me do this. I am capable of doing it. So when I see people go out and drink, and I used to come out on New Year's Eve when I worked uh, the morning shift at a radio station, I'd have to wake up at 2, 3 in the morning. I'd see people lying in their own vomit in, in the New York uh, gutters. I'd see people just falling asleep inside their cars. I used to think the same thing, amateurs. <clears throat> well, my wife, who is a loving person, a person who li like loves everybody around her, who showers the people she loves with love, who is a person, somebody the other day, I invited him over and he said, well, I, well, I got fed. And I said, son, the Amazon delivery guy gets fed at my house. My wife is just a loving person. So she looks at Valentine's Day and she says it's for amateurs. So the way I feel about Valentine's Day is the way I feel about New Year's Eve, okay? I believe that New Year's Eve is a good holiday. I think you should celebrate New Year's Eve. You should celebrate the passing of time. You should celebrate the passing of the year. You should assess where you've been over the course of the year. You should think about where you're going to go. I don't know if you make resolutions, but you should at least make plans and kind of chart out your thing. I just don't think you should go out and get drunk and, you know, and, and fall down in the gutter. I think that that's what you shouldn't do. I feel the same way about Valentine's Day. I hate these commercials. I hate these commercials that basically <clears throat> make your girlfriend or your wife look like a hooker. Every kiss begins with K. In other words, give her a diamond and you'll get a kiss. Give her a teddy bear and, oh, boy, you'll get lucky. I mean, they even have this kind of oozy, oleogenous uh, way of talking about these things. But I do believe, I do believe that it's not a bad thing every day to take a little time to be grateful for the person in your life who gives you partnership. And, th and this is the other thing. I don't like the emphasis on guys doing things for girls on Valentine's Day, that they're supposed to uh, give them stuff and thereby get their uh, affection. I think this is something we need to think about a little bit more. I think we need to think about the fact that we should be grateful for, for one another. Uh, it is a wonderful thing to have a woman in your life. It is an amazing, amazing gift uh, to have a woman in your life who cares about you. I mean, women care about you in ways that no man can ever care about anybody. And I think it's uh, it should be a good thing to have a man in your life. You know, I mean, the left turns everything into materialism. They turn everything into materialism. So they say, well, if you, you know, if you uh, clean house and keep house for your husband and he's uh, paying you, giving you his money while you're no better than paid help, that's crap. 
I mean, that's nonsense. These are acts of love that we do for one another, not just supporting one another. I mean, money <clears throat> money is no better than the things we do for each other anyway. So I, if you are somebody who supports your family, you do that out of love. If you're somebody who keeps house and makes a home for your family and feeds them uh, and gives them love, that's those are acts of love too. I just think the most important thing is the gratitude. I really do. Uh, you know, I used to say all the time that you should just be nice to one another, make sure to be polite to one another, make sure to say thank you. And then I realized that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you got to stop and think when somebody makes a cup of coffee for you. That's a big thing. That's an act of love. When somebody, uh, you know, puts a roof over your head, that's an act of love. When the electricity goes on because somebody paid the bills, that's an act of love. All these things are happening every day, not just Valentine's Day. And it's a good thing to remember them because that is really that is really what it's all about. The left has got this completely wrong. It's, these are, this is a spiritual relationship. It always has been. It was from the very beginning since Adam and Eve, and it still is. Every kiss should begin with love. So have a happy Valentine's Day. I won't be here on Monday. It is a long, long, clavenless weekend. There'll be no survivors. But if anybody crawls through it to the other side, I will be back on Tuesday. I'm Andrew Claven. This is The Andrew Claven Show. The Andrew Claven Show is produced by Robert Sterling and directed by Mike Joyner. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Senior producer, Jonathan Hay. Technical producer, Austin Stevens. And our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. Assistant director, Pavel Wydowski. Edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio mixed by Robin Fenderson. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. Animations are by Cynthia Angulo. Production assistants, McKenna Waters and Ryan Love. The Andrew Claven Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2020. If you prefer facts over feelings, aren't offended by the brutal truth, and you can still laugh at the insanity filling our national news cycle, well, tune in to The Ben Shapiro Show. We'll get a whole lot of that and much more. See you there.